Well, welcome back, everybody. Hey, I'm George, and I'm here, and we're glad you tuned in. So, of course, all we ask is that you subscribe. That's the only benefit we get out of this. Uh, if you feel like it, please comment below. We'll answer those, or, as always, you've got my contact. Uh, I'll answer calls, and I'll return emails. Now, let's move on to why we're here today. Um, I have been contemplating this for just a little while. I've got so many videos lined up and topics, um, and I've answered so many calls. I think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding, and it's probably because the videos that I did are so old that people are not going that far back to see them. So let's go back to the basics for just a little bit. Um, and we're going to touch on something very, very important, and that is grains and producing sugars, the fermentable sugars, and how that actually happens so that we don't get wrapped around uh, some of these long enduring questions that are, can be just answered very simply. Okay? There we are. Now, on to why we're actually here and the topic at hand. Crack corn. We're all familiar with crack corn. Flaked corn. Most of us are familiar with flaked corn. What is flaked corn? It's a byproduct of crack corn. Um, it's just been steamrolled so that it's a flake. And if you put one in your mouth and chew it, it's real crunchy. It's not like a frosted flake or corn flake. It's flaked corn. Um, it's real crunchy and there's little to no flavor. It's starchy. Now we have malted barley. Um, and remember, the term malted um, ha means something. It's very, very important, and we're going to cover that. And then finally, we have plain old table sugar. So this is what we're going for. Not table sugar, but fermentable sugar from any one of these products or a combination thereof. But how does all this happen? What are the steps. What are, I mean, if someone asked me, you know, what are you doing there and why are you doing that, I want to be able to explain to them the entire basics and history about, not history, but uh, scientifically really what's going on so that everyone else can understand what I'm doing and, oh, by the way, should something go wrong, I'll know where to look. Let's get right to it. Yes. Okay, this is my interpret, no, not interpretation, it's just a picture I drew of a, of a grain, a piece of grain. Um, this is actually uh, very, very similar to a, a piece of six-row barley. Now, each grain, of course, is going to be, the, the picture is going to look a little bit different because things are rearranged in different grains, that's all. But they all have some very similar basic characteristics. Um, and that is an endosperm, an embryo, a husk, and the alurone. Um, now, in some of them, they'll be called a germ instead of an embryo. Well, it's the embryo after the germ. Look, it... Let's not get wrapped around the axle. But here's what the, a piece of grain sliced in half is going to look like. You'll have the endosperm, which is all of this material in here. Now, this is the food storage for the grain, okay? The food storage. Uh, it's full of starches, proteins, and minerals, carbohydrates. Um, so that's the food storage area, all the endosperm. Now, this here is the embryo, which actually starts out smaller, but this one has been malted. Keep that in mind. It's been malted, and we'll get to that. So it's starting to grow, and there's the shoot that was, that did come out of that, but it has now been chopped off because we ended the malting process. So that's the embryo. Now, the, in order to grow this, it needs a food source, which is here. But it cannot consume that food source unless it's in the form of the energy that's necessary for all bio bodies, uh, grains and animals and everything, in order for them to consume for the energy. And that means it needs to be in a sugar base. So far, so good? Well, this alurone is the enzyme producer. That's this cover that goes across the whole thing. And that's nothing more than a layer with inside this seed, grain. 
Now, what happens in the malting process will take unmalted grain and lay this out in a bed, wet it, and then there's, there's different processes for doing this, but the purpose is to get it at the right temperature, at the right humidity, so that that water can enter into that grain and then cause this chemical reaction to start to take place. And, of course, the embryo to start to grow, and that's called sprouting. Now, once this sprouts a predetermined amount of time, the maltster, which is a separate profession all in itself, will stop that process by immediately drying the grain, which, once you remove all the moisture, it stops. What is left after that point, what is left is there will be some sugars that have been created. There'll be a little, some starches left over. Now when you crack that, and let's get one of these, it's a six row barley, and it's a real small grain, but if you bite it, you'll know there'll be a small residual sweetness to it. Hmm. And that's these sugars that have been stored up and converted in order for this shoot to grow. But the rest of it is nothing more than starch. So, that's what you have left. But what is not gone is the aluron. You've still got some left. And that's where we get into what we call the diastatic power, DP. The diastatic power of, of different grains are different levels, meaning the amount of enzymes left, the residual enzymes, after the malting process to continue to convert all the starch into fermentable sugars. Now, a grain, you only need a 30 lintner um, in a grain in order to convert the rest of this starch into fermentable sugars. Six-row barley is 160. So that leaves you with 130. So you've got plenty of enzymatic action to convert anything else. Are we making sense so far? This is where the amylase, amylase enzyme is created. And this covering or layer inside here is converting all of these carbohydrates into fermentable sugars. And again, just a real quick review. Once the malting process is stopped, because <coughs> it's ended before it's finished, we stop that. Then you've already got some sugars that are converted and available for the sprout, but it stopped. So that leaves us with all of these that haven't been converted. Now there's enough residual amylase to convert the rest of that grain and anything you add with it. That's why in almost every grain bill, you'll always find a malted grain is, a, is one of the additions. And it's not necessarily for flavor or profile or character, but it's there for this. The amylase, so it can convert the cereals that we're adding to the grain for those other reasons. It's there to convert that to fermentable sugars. I hope I haven't lost anybody yet. Um, this is really, really the basis and, and the simplest approach to understanding what happens in a grain. And of course, the husk. And you know what the husk is. It's the outside that holds it all together. Now we've got a picture right here. And you, you can see on this picture, uh, I did a close-up. You can see on this picture, this is a six-row barley cut in half. And you can clearly identify the embryo, which is that sprout. You can see how, how much it's grown, and it's not a whole lot. Uh, you can also see the endosperm in there, and if you look closely, you can see that dark ring that goes around there. That is the aluron. So that's what you have from that. Now, let's get into the discussion of flaked products um, and also cracked corn. Here, I get this all the time. George, I got a 50-pound bag of corn. I uh, cut, chopped the top off, I poured it in there, I added water, and, by, and I did the starch test. 
I ain't got no starch and it, I, nothing's happening. I ain't got no sugars. I said, well, just remember, your, your body, if you eat corn at night with a steak dinner, uh, you're going to see it the next day. If your stomach acid can't eat through that corn kernel, what makes you think anything else will? Okay, so you got to do something with that kernel. You got to crush it up, grind it up, do something with it, but because it, nothing can get into it because that corn kernel is protected. Everything inside that, the embryo, the endosperm, the alveolar, everything in there is protected. So we got to get to it. Yeah, remember that old TV show, I Love Lucy? You got some splaining to do. That's the time when I got to start splaining. And um, I just want everybody to understand that, that we've got to get at the inside of a grain in order for us to be able to do anything to it. So we've got to convert those starches to fermentable sugars. Are uh, you still with me? Yep. Please don't fall asleep yet. Now, we've got crack corn. Uh, the, really, like the definition of crack corn is just corn that, that they put into a cracker, uh, <laughs> into a large device that just kind of beats it up and pops it. Will it work? Yes. Um, should you grind it some more to get into the end? Yes. Because every one of those kernels, trust me, are not cracked. Most of them are, but... You can tell here, and I'm going to pull the right off the top, there's a full kernel that's not been cracked. So uh, this is what cracked corn will look like. And it comes out in several different sizes, shapes. and So you got to get at that too. So grind that up. Now, what do we have here? Since, since this process has not happened, we have not allowed it to grow any. Well, that means two things. <coughs> One... There are no sugars in this kernel. Bam. Um, second, since it wasn't germinated, that means that the alurone, the enzyme producer, has not activated. So there is no amylase in this kernel. What do we need to convert starches to fermentable sugars? We need amylase. There is no amylase in this kernel of corn. Now, we can do one of two things now, or really one of three things. Okay, we can either germinate this the same way they germinate grain. We can germinate this in a big burlap, burlap sack, you know, water it and just let it start to sprout, knock the sprouts off, again, grind it all up. Now you've got the amylase in there. That's one way. We can grind all this up, add it to our recipe, and add a couple pounds of six-row or two-row barley. Remember, there's enough amylase enzyme left over to convert itself and everything with it. Okay? Now, our third option, which some people go to, and it's, it, it works just as well, and that is we use amylase enzyme that we buy, I paid two bucks for this. Uh, this is one and a half ounces. A third teaspoon per gallon is plenty of amylase to convert the starch to fermentable sugars. And it's nothing more than just a, it, it, it looks just like a baby powder almost. So those are your real, those are your three options. <laughs> Let's consider flaked corn. Flaked corn, remember, has been steamrolled it was not germinated, so what do we have left over? You got it. We've got a flake of corn that is starch. That's what we have. Uh, uh, there's no amylase in here, there, none of that. So what do we have to do? We've got to convert it. We can convert that either by adding six row barley two row barley or other malts or just add some amylase enzyme. That, those are your three options. So no more should you have that challenge of, I, I put it in there, I thought, you know, because I, I get this all the time as well too, is, well I heard and someone told me and I, I kind of figured and I know you said this but I kind of thought if I did that, um, please don't overthink this. It's, it is really that easy. Um, when, when you overthink it and try to outthink it, you're not going to beat Mother Nature. 
You're not going to outsmart science. Uh, it, it's just the way it is. And some things we just have to accept. That's one of them. Trust me. Now, in the very end, what happens if I just put sugar and water in there? Do I need amylase for that? Certainly not. And I've had that question. No, you already have the final product you're looking for. Fermentable sugar. Remember, the only time that you need amylase, the only time, is when you're using cereals or grains that have not been malted. Amylase is necessary here. Oh, amylase is already here, so it's not necessary. Now, last but not least, there is another, there's a key point here to understand as well, that once reintroduced to water, this amylase is only active at 155 degrees. So, heat your grain up with all your cereals and your grain and heat all of that up to 155 degrees, turn the heat off, put the lid on it, let it sit by itself for 90 minutes. Okay, uh, the majority of your conversion will happen in the first 30 to 40 minutes. Give it 90 minutes to complete. And then when you open it up, do your starch test and uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised. It works every time. Now, do not leave the heat on because you will inoculate your amylase. Uh, if it gets too hot, you will inoculate your amylase. If it gets too low, it will just stop. So please, just follow that simple rule. Put the lid on it at 155 degrees. It will retain heat long enough to do its conversion. You don't have to do anything else to it. This is, cri this is a critical step. Um, the, too many, too many times uh, we go through all of this effort and put all this effort into it and wind up not converting any starches and therefore we throw yeast in and nothing happens and we scratch our head and wonder why. Well, it's, let, let's go back to the basics and let's get this right and your combinations right and what you use correct and you will be successful. Now, a side note, we sold over 420 PID controllers. Um, and I just want to throw up a couple of pictures of different ones that we've, we've got out there. Of all of those that we have sold right here, you can contact me. Uh, just send me an email. Um, out of all of those, I've had three failures. And I'm disappointed. That is a 0.7% uh, um, failure rate. And uh, that disturbs me. Um, Two of them were error, uh, user error, um, and one of them was my fault. But in any case, um, it, when you have a problem like that, uh, you, if, if, if these people would talk to you, they will tell you that I'll just send you a shipping label, ship it back to me, I'll fix it, I'll ship it back to you. Uh, no problem. Uh, if you blow it up, sorry, I'm going to have to charge you for a repair, but uh, please just be upfront with me. If, if it's rated at 20 amps, Please don't plug in multiple elements. If you want a, multi, a, a multiple element controller, let me know. Get it right the first time. Okay? Man, I'll tell you what, that brings us to a close. I feel so much better now that I've explained all of that. <clears throat> and I truly think that we're on the road to success here. Now, we've got to take this the next level, the next step. And uh, we've, we're going to discuss on the next video... Uh, if I get it in the right order, we're going to discuss the fermentation process and we're going to really dig in deep into uh, yeast. Um, the yeast colonies, development, lifespan, uh, what's best for them, how they actually operate, what are stresses, uh, how do we avoid... Uh, see, there I go. I'm, I'm getting into it already. I don't want to do that yet. In any event, you know, as always, we say happy distilling.